Welcome to lecture 17. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the SN1 reaction. And we'll cover the, the details of the SN1 reaction about the electrophile and the nucleophile and the rate laws and the leaving group. Um, we'll also talk about rearrangements. And then we're also going to, um, and we'll talk about energy reaction diagram. And then we'll compare the differences for how to distinguish which reaction will go SN2 and which reaction will go SN1. And then I'll have um, two separate videos working your Pogel exercises. Okay, so the details of your SN1 reaction. I am on page 311 of your textbook. And the substrate that the book has chosen to illustrate your SN1 reaction is this compound here, okay? And we will use the same, we'll use this nucleophile. And then um, we'll look at the substrate. Okay, so uh, first of all, you have to have alkyl halides as your substrate for substitution reactions. And um, at this point, see if you can decide whether that is a um, alkyl halide that will undergo substitution, and let's classify it. You always want to classify your alkyl halide. Okay, so here's your carbon that's bonded to your halogen. Um, this compound's name would be 1, 2, 3, so it would be 2 methyl. 2-bromo propane, and most people would probably put the 2-bromo before the 2-methyl just because B comes before M in the alphabet. Okay, so we're just looking at our alkyl halide, and that carbon is bonded to 1, 2, 3 carbons, so that is a tertiary alkyl halide. And if you put in your um, dipole moment, you'd see that your dipole pulls electrons to the bromine, the bromide, so it makes the carbon a little delta positive. So there's your dipole. Okay, so this alkyl halide is your electrophile. So there's your electrophile that I just abbreviate E, the positive. And your nucleophile here is methanol. Now, methanol is your nucleophile. Um, now, we always draw um, our electrons from our nucleophile to electrophile, but this is an SN1 reaction. Um, an SN1 reaction, let's talk about the name. The S stands for substitution. Okay, so we're going to substitute the halide for the nucleophile. And that's what the N stands for, the nucleophile. So it's the nucleophile that substitutes the halide. And the 1 is the rate law. So the rate for this reaction, um, how fast it will go, is only dependent on your um, alkyl halide. OK, so this is why you have the one. It's only dependent on one species of reactant. And so if you increase the concentration of this 2-bromo, two 2-methyl two propane, your reaction will go faster. If you increase methanol, it won't make a difference. In fact, these reactions are usually done in their nucleophilic solvent. So when your solvent is your nucleophile, so this would be basically um, 2-bromo-2-methyl propane stirred around in a solvent such as methanol. That's called savolysis. Savolysis. So solvent, solvent, savolysis. Okay. So that is a savolysis reaction. Now, what happens here in the mechanism 
well, let's just go ahead and write a product. So our substitution product would be this. And what's the functional group here? This would be an ether. And then you also would get HBr. So where does the H come from? The H is here. Comes from the methanol. And then the Br obviously came from your tertiary alkyl halide. So, and this is an ether because you have an oxygen bonded to two carbons on either side. So we converted an alkyl halide into an ether. And this is an SN1 reaction. So the mechanism for this is the following. So let's write our reaction again. And then we get All right, so what happens here, the first step, step one, the leaving group leaves to form the most stable carbocation. Okay, this is going to be important, the most stable carbocation. And what is a carbocation? It's a carbon. bonded to only three things and it's an electron deficient carbon and so therefore its formal charge is positive. It is sp2 so what's the carbocation look like? This would be flat and planar and then you have so this is all flat 120 degrees and then in the plane you have this unhybridized p orbital okay and so you want to have the most stable carbocation and you learn that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, more stable than primary, and more stable than methyl. And I'm telling you also to include allylic and benzylic. Okay, and they're up there with tertiary and sometimes more stable. So an allylic carbocation would be this. A benzylic is when you have a benzene ring and it's the CH that's right here on the benzylic position and the tertiary is like what you're seeing here okay there's tertiary and the secondary would look something like that with this carbon being bonded to carbons primary and, and methyl will not form for the most part okay so you can simplify your understanding by um, if you see methyl and primary you need to start thinking SN2 but when you see a tertiary then you need to be thinking SN1 okay allylic and benzylic can do both these can do both SN1 and SN2 and secondary it all depends on the conditions for SN1 and SN2 okay but Tertiary will only do SN1, and then methyl and primary will only do SN2. All right, so that is about your electrophile, folks. Okay, so the first thing, the electrophile, your alkyl halide, the leaving group leaves to form the most stable carbocation. So how you show this is you just show those electrons leaving. So you show one electron flow arrow. And so in step one, you just basically, for the reaction mechanism, you can write the leaving group leaves. So you could show it like this. And then that forms the more stable carbocation. Okay, so that's step one. And then step two, the nucleophile 
And this needs to be a weak nucleophile. Okay. We'll talk about what happens if you have a strong one. It has to be a weak. Okay. It has to be a weak nucleophile. So that means no charges, folks. Methanol is weak. has no charge. So then the nucleophile attacks the most stable car carbocation. So this nucleophile then will come in here, and then you draw that product. And that product would look like this. And it can come from the top, or it can come from the bottom. So you do not have any stereochemistry like you did in SN2. Now, you notice that's a positive. Oxygen is bonded to three things, hydrogen, CH3, and then the carbon. Um, so then the next step, and a lot of times nobody even puts it because it's so fast, it's just a proton transfer because you always want to show your neutral product. And so what would do that? Probably another methanol molecule because it's what you have the most of. And it would take this. This is just kind of like an acid base reaction, right? And you would get CH3OH2. And that's kind of acidic, right? What's the pKa? I think we said about 1.7. Okay, so that's acidic. Um, and then that gives you your product. Why is it important that I show you that that's acidic? Well, the reason why that's important is because under acidic conditions, which are positive conditions, acidic conditions have the proton, they stabilize. They stabilize the carbocation. So your reaction needs to stabilize this intermediate carbocation. And that happens under slightly acidic or very acidic conditions. Folks, you're never going to have a carbocation intermediate in a negative environment. Negative environments are like basic environments, okay? So this is sodium methoxide. This is very basic. If you put some pH paper in there, it'd probably be pH of 12. Sodium hydroxide, these are your strong nucleophiles. They also are very strong bases. That would probably be a pH of 14. You see the negative charge, okay? Um, carbocations will not be stable. They will not be generated in a negative environment. So by um, having this methanol deprotonate this hydrogen creates this acidic environment. So this is an SN1 reaction. Let's look at the um, reaction energy diagram for this reaction because you want to be able to draw that. Okay, so for the reaction energy diagram, we'll stick with our reaction of 2-methyl to uh, bromopropane, and then our nucleophile, methanol. And this goes to our product, which is an ether. All right, and then HBr, but we don't really care about that. All right, so let's do our reaction energy diagram. We have energy on the y-axis, and then our reaction coordinate on our x-axis. And now this reaction is going to have a high peak and then a valley, OK? Now you saw in um, the SN2 reaction, there was no valley. What's the valley mean? Valley is your intermediate. So this is actually an intermediate. We've talked about the different reactive intermediates, and this happens to be the carbocation. So I'm just going to draw that in there. There's your carbocation. So what happens here? The bromine is your leaving group. This is your electrophile. This is your nucleophile. OK, so the bromine leaves, and you generate an intermediate, which is your carbocation, 
okay? And so that is going to be in your valley. Now what's your starting material? Your electrophile. There's your starting material, and you can put methanol in there too if you want. That's in your reaction flask. It has a certain amount of energy. And then your product here is your ether, and we'll put that there. Okay, so there's your energy for your starting material and your product. Now, you can see that this is an exothermic reaction. So if we figured out the delta H for the reaction, it'd be between the starting material and the product because this is lower, this is exothermic. You can put numbers in, you can make this a 10, you can make this a 50 kilojoules per mole. And to calculate your delta H, you would go products minus reactants, 10 minus 50, that's a negative 40, negative delta H is exothermic. Okay, it gives off energy to the atmosphere. Now, um, the next, so what are these um, top peaks? These are transition states, and you don't have to draw transition states, but you do have to really make sure you have your most stable carbocation intermediate because that's going to determine the rea reaction rate. And so the difference between your starting material and this is what? Remember AE? We'll call that AE1. That's the activation energy. That determines the rate of the reaction. Okay, and notice that we have a 1. This is AE2. You notice where I take it from. A lot of people made this mistake. You go from the valley. So which is larger, AE1 or AE2? AE1 is greater than AE2. All right? So that means the rate determining step is going to be here. Okay? It's going to be this one right here. This is your rate determining step. This is RDS, rate determining step. Or you can call it rate limiting step. Some places call it RLS. That's to generate your carbocation. And folks, in that mechanism, this is all you do. It's the leaving group leaves. So the reaction mechanism, the rate of the reaction, is just dependent, depends on leaving group leaving. So this is your rate of reaction. It just depends on making that intermediate. And that is why the rate of the reaction is unimolecular with K reaction constant dependent on the electrophile and the electrophile only. And so that's why the SN1 reactivity is going to be, like I said, lilic and benzylic greater than tertiary, greater than secondary. I don't even go any further because the other ones would rather um, undergo um, SN2. Now why, and we'll just, I'll just refresh this, it's called hyperconjugation. You all know what hyperconjugation is, because we talked about it in chapter four, but I didn't give you the term. Um, hyperconjugation is on page 313 in your book, and this is where the alkyl groups are electron donating. Okay, and so the electron donating groups, EDG, all right, electron donating group, the methyls, um, stabilize the carbocation, carbon. And so how does it do that? Well, the best way to show you this is to draw this out. So here we have carbon, and carbon is an sp3, right? And so it's sp3, that means it has these orbitals like this, these wolf ball bats, and then this orbital here, okay, so then the unhybridized p orbital, we can draw like this, okay? And this is an empty orbital. And what is the empty orbital like? It likes electrons. And see this hydrogen here? This overlap here, it can feel the presence, okay? And that's like maybe a very, very weak overlap. 
but it's enough to stable lies um, the carbocation empty orbital. So if you have that one, and then you also have one over here, which makes it a secondary, okay, you have this hyperconjugation stabilization. And so the more alkyl groups you have on that carbocation, the more stabilizing it will be. Now, what else would be very important in an SN1 reaction for the rate? How good is your leaving group? Okay, this is going to be very impactful. I mean, when your rate of reaction is only dependent on your leaving group, I mean, on your electrophile, then X, your leaving group, needs to be great. Okay? And so, great leaving groups. What are the great leaving groups? These are going to be ones, that's just LG, leaving group. They're going to be stabilized. They're going to stabilize a negative charge. Okay? So, iodide is better than chlorine. And the reaction rate would be a lot faster. Why is that? Well, do you remember the size when we were talking about conjugate bases and the stability of conjugate bases? It's very similar. Iodide is very large. That means it's very polarizable. That means to give it an extra electron, it's very stable. Okay, it can be by itself. Um, you will also see um, these sulfonate. Let's see if we have them on here leaving groups. I don't see them in your book, but you're going to see something called a tosyl, um, the sulfate leaving groups. Okay, and these tend to be great leaving groups too. Okay, this whole thing is a great leaving group, and the reason why is because it can undergo resonance and it can stabilize this negative charge. So we're going to talk about leaving group ability. When I look at um, 9B, I look at your models. The first model talks about um, what, what a nucleophilic reaction looks like and its mechanism. And then we're going to talk about rearrangements to get um, tertiary carbocations and then it talks about the differences between the mechanisms between SN1 and SN2. Um, so let me just talk about rearrangements real quick. Okay, so I told you that there's probably not a week that went by that I didn't do an SN2 reaction. Okay, this is very useful and it's very, it's stereo specific, okay, and, and it does nucleophilic backside attack. Problem with SN1, I'm going to put a problem, make a sad face, okay, you get rearrangements. Now, when you're trying to make molecules, you don't want rearrangements, unless there's only one rearrangement, it happens to happen, okay, um, and you got to look at this, you got to look for this when you're doing SN1. So let's look at this. We have this compound here, and it's an ethanol. And so what's your, what's your, you'll get the thing, what's your major organic product? So if you took a minute to, to do that, okay? And many of you might say, okay, let's see, the bromine is going to leave. All right, and that's going to give me my carbocation intermediate. All right, and then methanol is going to come in here. So let's just go step one, leaving group leaves. Step two, nucleophile comes in. And then step three, we have a proton transfer. So you get this molecule here for step three. And then you get your proton transfer, and you get something like this. 
you're like, okay, there's my, my product, okay? And I'm going to tell you, no, that's not, that's not your major organic product. Okay, so what happens is, step one, what did I say? Leaving group leaves to form the most stable carbocation. So, I want you to write, I will always perform my carbo cation test. If you do that, you'll get the right answer. Okay, I will always perform my carbo cation test. So let's do it right here. Okay, so our reaction mechanism. And you want this on your reactions sheet. Step one. Leaving group leaves to form most stable carbocation. All right, so we got to do our carbocation test. So let's classify. This is a secondary, okay? And then you got to look at the neighbors. What if you trade places with this one? It's just your neighbors, okay? So if you traded places with the carbocation, so what you don't see here is this has three hydrogens, right? And this carbocation has an empty p orbital. These electrons will actually come over here. It could. And then you would get the plus over here, and the hydrogen goes there. This is called a 1-2 hydride shift. And a hydride shift actually takes us two electrons. It's the opposite of a proton. Okay? Or, you got to look at your other neighbor. This is a secondary. So how many neighbors are there? Two neighbors. Primary only has one neighbor. Tertiary has three. So we're going to do this neighbor one. Okay, and this is neighbor two. So here we are. This has a hydrogen here. And so what if that hydrogen changed places? Okay, so if that hydrogen changed places, it would go here. And then you get your carbocation on this carbon. Well, let's classify them. The top one, that's a primary carbocation. The bottom one, tertiary carbocation. So which one's your most stable? tertiary. So the tertiary will happen. So the intermediate here is actually this one here. And then the, this is ethanol, will actually come in and add to the carbocation. And then I'm just going to do my proton transfer. A lot of times you don't show that. Okay. So there is your product. All right, so there's your product from a rearrangement SM1 reaction. Now, if you look at page 320 and 321 in your book, it talks about the parameters of when you're going to have an SM1 reaction or an SN2 reaction. And I will try my best to kind of organize these with you and then um, 9B model will help you with it. Okay, so you have to first classify your alkyl halide. Okay, and you need to classify your nucleophile. So classify your alkyl halide. You just bit is it allylic? Is it benzylic? Is it tertiary? Is it secondary? Is it methyl, um, primary, or methyl? Uh, classify your nucleophile. Is it strong or is it weak? Okay, that's the first thing you do. Now, if you have a strong nucleophile and you have secondary, primary, methyl, allylic, or benzylic, it's going to be an SN2. Okay, if it's going to be a substitution. All right, if it is a weak nucleophile, 
That means no charges. The difference between that, like methanol, a strong nucleophile would be like methoxide. You see the, the, the um, negative charge? Okay, so here we have a weak nucleophile, and then primary can be allylic, benzylic, and tertiary. And this is going to be an SN1. Um, we're also going to bring in another layer with elimination reactions, and we'll have to talk about that. But we're not going to do that until the um, next exam. Um, also, other things to consider. your solvent okay so you can have a polar a protic solvent you can have a polar protic solvent and then there's nonpolar solvents okay now savolysis so is going to be a weak solvent and, and that's also going to be your, nu your nucleophile Polar aprotic solvents, some of these are called DMF, THF. So what do these acronyms mean? Tetrahydrofuran is an ether. Um, N-dimethylform amide. Dimethyl, N-dimethylform amide. Okay. So this is an aldehyde. This is not, a. this is aprotic without proton. Okay, a protic solvent would be like methanol. Okay, so is that a polar molecule? Yes, it has a dipole. So if you did your Lewis structure, you would see that there's a dipole, so that makes it polar. And it's protic because it has a hydrogen that it can hydrogen bond off of the oxygen. Um, is there a hydrogen? on the oxygen, the heteroatom for tetrahydrofuran? No. So this is a polar aprotic. So like even though you see a hydrogen here, it's, is it that hydrogen on a heteroatom? Is it on nitrogen or oxygen? We don't even worry about fluorine. You don't see it much. No. Okay. So this is aprotic. But they're polar. Is there a polar bond there? You betcha. Okay. Now nonpolar Nonpolars would be your alkanes, so like hexanes, okay, uh, toluene, might see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then dichloromethane, so your halogens are considered nonpolar. And um, now, these solvents you want to choose, um, if you want SN2, you want that charge, you want to make that nucleophile strong, you want, you want to use polar aprotic. So you're going to do these in THF and you're going to do them in DMF. Um, acetone would be a strong, um, that would be a polar aprotic solvent. Um, usually for SN1, you're going to, you're, you're going to pretty much do it in like methanol, just your weak nucleophile. So really the only time you worry about solvents is when you're looking and you want, you get to design it, you want your reaction to definitely go SN2. So you're going to pick that solvent, the polar aprotic solvent, because you want your nucleophile to be as strong as possible. And you're going to choose fast electrophiles. Okay. Um, and also stereochemistry, very important. SN2 gives you um, inversion. So you're going to find that like an R typically becomes an S and an S becomes an R at a stereo center. And here you're going to have um, loss of stereochemistry. You're not going to have any stereochemistry. So this thing when you don't have, when you have 50 of one and 50 of the other, you have racemization. Okay, because that nucleophile is going to come in from the top and it's going to come in from the bottom of your carbocation. But hey, don't, don't forget, you get rearrangements. You're always going to be looking for rearrangements for the SN1.
okay? So for S and 1, you have to be looking for that uh, rearrangement. All right, the book has a great summary on page 322, 323, and 324. Now we're going to do some Pogel.